So again, these are still, uh, all these slides are still covered under Creative Commons. So as long as uh, attribution is given, you can share them, remix them, whatever you like. Um, and we're gonna jump into our second script. Uh, and the second script here is uh, what you actually did on your break. So uh, by the end of this lecture, uh, you'll be able to analyze and graph categorical data in R, uh, create graphics made of multiple plots, um, and then independently start, write, and run an analysis in R without the script being made for you beforehand at all. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and clear our yeses. It looks like we're ready to get started here. So um, you all have uh, your... Uh, Oh, no, this is uh, just a review of day one. And now we just did a little assignment. And so you should have created a, a graph, something like this. So um, here you would have set your working directory. You would have uh, read in your data, okay? You inspect your data. So you look at head, the structure of the data. You would have created a factor. So I had a lot of questions about this um, come up on the Slack. So um, you could have just left the levels labeled as zero and one if you wanted to. So you don't actually have to add labels here. And these would have showed up as zero and one. And that's totally fine. It's okay to have numbers as your labels for your factors. Um, but oftentimes when you have people reading a graph, you want them to know what the zeros and ones represent, for example. But it's totally fine to not actually um, add labels on there, okay? Um, next, you could do a box plot if you're using base R. Uh, you could do a box plot that doesn't look like this. It looks like a base R one, similar to what we did before. A lot of people had issues with the legend. So if you used the coordinates from the previous example, um, then it's far outside of the actual coordinates. So as you can see, these biomarker values take on um, values around like between zero and one. So if you set it at like 93, for example, as your y-axis value, it's far outside of this graph. So you wanna make sure that your legend table is somewhere in here. Um, your coordinates are somewhere in the range of your actual um, uh, graph that you're showing. Um, so that's likely the issue coming up there. So here we're creating a legend. Um, I just added these colors um, because, you know, they could be anything you'd like. Um, and then down here, if you wanted to do a ggplot graph, um, again, create a box plot with ggplot. Similar to what we did before, y is the biomarker, x is the responder factor that was created up here. Um, and this, it actually is important that this is the factor variable, uh, whereas here, it didn't actually have to be the factor variable. Um, all right, so, and uh, the legend would come up automatically because we did the scale fill manual here, all right? So um, I hope you all found that okay. Um, if you didn't, uh, in the next break, uh, we can discuss it, but now we're gonna move on um, and work on our next script, all right? And so this one is gonna be totally from scratch. So you're gonna open up in R here. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna show it here. You're just gonna open up a new R script. So here, I'll show that again plus sign R script, open up a new script, and you're gonna just get started from a fresh, clean script here, okay? And you're gonna read in example data two. You're gonna start your script by setting your working directory. So you wanna tell it where that data is. You'll need to go and download that data from um, uh, the website. So here it's pinned. The website is actually pinned on the Slack. Um, but here is the data, so example data two, all right? It's a TXT file now, so not a CSV file anymore, okay? Read in your data using read table instead of read.csv. Everything else will be the same, but it's a new function. And you're going to create three factors now, okay? So now we have more characters uh, or more different groups. So you're going to have a factor for your sex variable, a factor for your site variable, and a factor for your treatment variable. So these are three new variables you're creating in that data frame. And once you've done that, go ahead and click yes. So this, now you're really going to be set out on your own. Um, and feel free to post questions, um, snippets of code, whatever uh, screenshots in the Slack, uh, and we can all work together to solve any issues you're coming across, okay?
All right, we've got a no. Feel free to just cut a little snippet of uh, what errors you're coming across, if anything. All right. Thanks, Gabby. So we got a couple yeses coming along. Some really nice sharing from Dahlia. I'm sure others are experiencing confusion about those parentheses. You only want one pair of parentheses around your whole command here or around your whole uh, containing your function here. All right, Ren also needs a breakout round. Um, okay, no problem. Thanks, Greg.
uh, ran, I might have chosen the wrong um, wrong user for you. I can't find you in the list. Uh, but if that was the right one, feel free to join the room and I'll see you in a moment. Hmm. Do you have three? Um, Christina, um, is your DF3 in your environment? Um, um, like I read it in, is mm -hmm. that what you mean? Yeah, and so you see DF3 there, like it's- Yeah, like I have it open on like the top, like I opened it up to click on it and look beauty, at it. Beauty, okay, so that's there. Um, how about treated? Is that uh, a column in it? Is that spelled right and, and the capitals are all there? Yes, but I didn't know if it was different because it's a table now, like it doesn't really have a the header part or maybe I just didn't you have to still tell that for read table then right I probably just missed adding that part. Mm, yes, if if you said header equals true. I didn't added. add that for that one I thought I didn't know if that I guess I didn't realize for the read table. Okay, then yeah that's no late. that's fine absolutely this is a yeah trial and error so maybe it doesn't see that. Um, yeah header yeah. Thank you. Um, no worries. Please do not ask for a breakout room directly. Please at least describe your problem or uh, write. And Gabrielle, can you, I don't, uh, is she here or is she? No, she's not here. Okay. Yeah, so everyone's in uh, breakout rooms. Uh, Diego, in the meantime, uh, yeah, do you wanna just take a little screenshot? It's really helpful for us all to see um, any errors you're coming across. Yeah, I can do that. Awesome. Perfect. So the levels, um, they need to be in quotes. So um, the M and the F there, um, the reason it's giving you errors is, um, yeah, it just needs quotes around those, Carmen. Yeah, exactly. So when it's a number, R is fine with no quotes, but when it's um, anything that's not a number, so um, any um, character strings of any kind, they all have to have quotes around them, unless they're a variable. So um, R is looking for that M to be a variable, and then F, it, you notice it's orange there, it's actually saying that's false. Uh, so it's like, oh, uh, false and the M variable is what it's think interpreting. Yep, so Diego, you're getting the same issue. You'll wanna put your M in quotes and your F in quotes. Otherwise, this should run just fine. And yep, and then um, Reza, you're um, just missing a um, closed parenthesis there. Um, let's see. Do you think you could um, take a wider screenshot? I want to see just if um, it's uh, if it's a plus sign um, or what it's what it's doing there. Because it looks like it might be um, it might be an issue from above. All right, and Lambert, I'm not sure if I've done everything yet. This is looking awesome. Levels, yep, yep, good, great. Lambert, that's right. Um, you can go ahead and click yes, you're good to go.
Okay. Ah, uh, Reza, the problem is when you say levels, you need a little C um, in front of the parentheses there. So it says levels equals and then just parentheses zero one. You want to concatenate them. So it's a vector that needs to be there. Um, that's definitely not something that's immediately obvious. So um, no worries. But yeah, you'll just want to see in front of that. Um, can you also explain the first one? Because I, I feel mm -hmm. like uh, I saw somebody wrote M and F. So mm -hmm. it should be, should be M and F or zero one is fine here. Aha. Uh -huh. So if we look at the data itself, um, one sec. Because sex, it's coming in as M's and F's. Mm -hmm. You'll want it to be M and F in instead of zero one. So in levels, you want a quote M and a quote F. Um, so basically, if I understand it correctly, for example, if it's not like one character, say, uh, it's like a four level, say we say, um, uh, based on like BMI, obese, non-obese, uh, something like that. So four, four uh, types or four groups. So in that case, concatenate bracket, like close bracket, bracket start with like uh, obese, non-obese, normal so i have to like spell out all those yeah yeah if you want to label them that but maybe in your in your data frame you have it labeled as like um o n n n something uh -huh. like that then you would write those in the levels um yeah. argument you would write those out in quotes but if they're not in one character they're in like multiple characters instead of o m like one, not one letter but Whole the word. Yep. So then in you that have case, write it all. Yeah. Okay. So the like concatenate, but it's this one. In this case, it's not under the quotation mark, right? Um. So in this case, so for male and female, mm -hmm. for that one, you want it to be um levels, and then in quotes M and mm -hmm. F in quotes. So uh, similar to what Dahlia has here, she's pretty okay. close. Um, yeah, and so Dahlia, sorry, just to jump to yours, you just need a DF dollar sign uh, sex in that first argument there. But um, Lambert, you can, or sorry, uh, Reza, you can see in Dahlia's, um, she has levels equals and then concatenate M and F. Yeah. Equals, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys for sharing these errors. This is really helpful. All right. And don't forget to click yes once you've created these three factors. So you just have your data read in, and then you created the three factors. Uh, no, Dahlia, so for yours, it's um, the first uh, argument here. Um, so I'll just show you actually on my screen here. So here where it says DF sex, you actually want it to be DF dollar sign sex. So you have DF dollar sign sex. Here though, the problem is it will have now overwritten it and it's gonna be missing values. Um, so it, it could be that you've now lost it. You may need to read your data in. So you just go back up to the top, read in your data, and then run this line, but have dollar sign sex and maybe change this to sex factor or something. Uh, so you don't, if you override it, you're not overriding um, and, and make a mistake. You're not overriding missing values, for example. Um, as is, yeah, thanks for asking, Ron. So as is, it, um, it says when something is a um, text string, a character string, 
um, in the, the data, so in um, the actual text file that you read in, it's not by default creating a factor, it just keeps them as strings. So R doesn't assume that it's a grouping variable. So when you say as is equals true in this, it's going to say, okay, this um, sex is just going to be kept as a character string. It's just going to be quote M and quote F. If we didn't have that set to that, then it would say this is a grouping variable. And the first group I see is M. So that's a baseline. And the second one is F. So that's the alternative. So this is an example where um, not reading in uh, the data frame as is. So you could say as is equals false. It might actually automatically give you the factor you want for sex. So, um, so it could work either way. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. We're getting it. Oops, sorry about that. Um, there we go. And don't forget to click yes once you guys have it. And go ahead and experiment. If you want to start plotting things, you know, um, exploring the data, check out structure, um, check out the ranges. Yeah, so Reza, just make sure you put the M and the F in quotes. Wonderful, almost there guys. And as you can see, many of you are having the exact same issues. So sharing your, sharing your errors is very helpful for everyone. All right, I'm gonna let the last few people Get theirs together. And don't forget to click yes once you've got it. And we'll move on once it's there.
All right. Are they there? I'll give two more minutes and then we'll get it all in the solution. Mm. Nagla, so the levels, they zero and one, because they're numeric, they don't have to be in quotes. I know it's kind of annoying. So the numbers don't have to be in quotes. That can be just zero one. Um, but the, um, the uh, character strings do have to be in quotes like um, M and F. So here it's levels and then quote zero one. Just zero and one, no quotes. Great question. What can I? Mm hmm. Um. So a couple things. So you could say unique. Unique. Um. Let's say df sec. This will give all the unique values. If you want to see just what are all the possible values that column could take if it is a um if it is a uh factor already and you want to look at the levels i believe you can use levels and then df and then it say sex factor um then it will show the levels yeah it's say it's not it's row it's not factor yet so for okay. example the site when i when mm -hmm. i was doing it i was curious because our table is small so in yeah. that case, it was easy to see like one and two, like scrolling, you know, like opening the table, data totally. frame. And, but when um, I'm dealing with a big table, um, so unique is the one way to do it, like mm -hmm. to check how many, how many uh, levels are there, right? Like in yep. one column? Okay. Yep. Okay. Right. Let's see. So Lauren, just, uh, I'm, you were typing something in you're still on your, your PDF, you're still showing, right? Or were you wanting to show what you were typing? No. Okay, it's okay. just in the, or yeah. You were, okay, okay, you were not showing, so that's good. Yeah, <laughs> good, as intended. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, yeah, so Diego, you could do either. You could add new columns like you show here, or you can overwrite columns like some others have been doing. Um, in general, I believe adding a column is better because then you can verify that you've done it correctly. Um, whereas if you override it, you lose the original data. Um, and so you won't know um, if you've actually um, recoded the factor uh, correctly necessarily. Um, it's easy to make errors that way. So exactly right. You have now um, multiple columns added on to that original data frame and those columns are all factors. So that's great. All right, everyone. So if there's anyone who has uh, some additional questions on this front, oh, let's see here, Nagla. Um, let's, let's go through the solution and see if that actually um, clarifies some things here. All right, so uh, as we saw, there's actually multiple ways to do this, multiple right answers. Um, so this is just one right answer. So here, of course, I'm setting my working directory. Um, I'm reading in my data. But here I use read table. The reason is these are tab separated values now. Um, see, so they're separated by just white space um, here. And so now it's a table. R is going to read it in and it's going to say, great, I'm not looking for commas anymore because those are comma separated values here. I'm looking for white space. And when there's a white space, it's treated like a new column. So here in the second row, you can see, OK, this is the ID. And now there's some white space. And now the next column is age. So it's going to treat this as age. OK, and then more white space. OK, now I have the sex value. All right. So this is how it's reading it in. Um, you can investigate it using lots of these uh, different functions. We can see the names, the head, uh, dim structure of the data um, to 
see kind of what it is uh, looking like, though a lot of people brought up that there's other things maybe you'd like to know, like what are the unique values in the column? So you could do that. Um, I'm just gonna actually now show my data frame. So first I want this to be changed to Lauren Erdman desktop. And I'm just gonna hope that I have it. Oops, I might need it in the, there we go, okay. Um, and then I can see these. Now, when we're creating these factors, okay, that was a really good question. I believe Reza asked where, you know, maybe you just don't know like all the values these can take on. So what you can do first is, so here I said um, structure and I saw these and I'm like, great, okay. Like I see these ones and I know that I want sex, site and treated to all become factors. What I can do is I can say, um, you know, sex I'm pretty confident about like MF, good. This one is fine, that factor is fine. But what about site factor? There could be 25 sites, you know, there could be any number. So you can use something called unique. Oops, excuse me, unique. And then I, so DF2 here, and then I say site. And then if I run that, then I know there's only two values that can take. So then when I'm writing out site factor, my levels would be specified one, two. And then I say, you know, in this case, I want site one to be my baseline. So I'm just gonna say site one, site two, and this is ordered one, two. So they're corresponding there. Okay, similarly, a treatment factor, I mean, you could have levels of treatment, different types of treatment. So here, again, if we want to look at what are the unique values, we could say um, DF2 treatment factor, treat, treated, no, that was right, so treated, and we see, okay, it's ones and zeros. And actually I want zero to be my baseline, untreated versus treated. So here um, I say it's control versus treated and zero is control and one is treated. You could have named them anything you wanted. That's totally fine. Um, and then here, what ends up happening is um, as I believe um, Diego pointed out, I'm creating three new columns. So now if I look in my environment pane, so I'm gonna open it up here doing that. DF2, I could look here if I wanted and I see they're added on here. I could have also looked down here and said structure DF2 to compare to my original structure up here and I see they're added on. I see my levels and I see which levels there are. Um, and then I see the encodings here. Note that these are um, numeric here. So these are the which factor it is um, by order. So the first one, if it says one, it's the baseline. So it's one. If it's two, it's the second one. If there were a three in here, it would be the third factor. And it's just following the order of the levels that you set out here, okay? All right, so I'm just gonna go back here, create factors. All right. How can you count the unique values? Great question. So when you run unique, this is a vector that you get out. So remember length, you can actually use length, length around that vector that is output by unique. So then control enter. It's a length of two. That's how many unique values there are. Okay. All right, and I just wanna zoom in on Rand's error here. Okay. Change the, uh, because you have to use ggplots. Uh, it's a new geom. So ylab becomes its own function there, Rand. All right, okay, so going back here, let's talk about some quick stats. Um, you're doing lots of stats um, all the time. Uh, theoretically, you wanna mean, you wanna know the range of values, you'd like to summarize them. 
these are some nice and useful um, ones. But again, you know, if you want to figure out like, um, let's say you want the variance. So, oh, there's no documentation. So there's no function called variance, but I could try double question mark and then it will search um, for things that are not exact matches. Well, this is terrible. Let's see. Matrix stats, weighted var, mm, that's not really what I want. Variance, covariance, matrix. Darn guys, I think I just chose a bad one. Um, so here, stats var, this is actually gonna give you the variance var. Okay, so then we could say um, var, um, let's look at the variance of our DF2 marker one. All right, so you can use these quick stats or these functions uh, to find uh, stats for your values. So here is the mean, it's the arithmetic mean. So you could take the mean of the age, the mean of marker one, standard deviation, right? Take the standard deviation of either range. This will give you the minimum and maximum value. So we talked before, um, like during the break and right after, about how um, sometimes when you were putting the legend somewhere in your plot, you were not finding the legend, you're not seeing it. And sometimes you wanna know what are the range of values that a certain variable can take so that you can know what are some values that I can use to actually see the legend in my plot. Range is going to output the minimum and the maximum value. So here, if we did range marker two, ah, actually, sorry, first I wanna show you something. Um, if I want to uh, use or revise this, what has just been written, I can access anything that has been um, output or, or run on my console here by just using my arrow keys. So my cursor is here and I'm just arrowing up. So that is something I ran just before. This is something I ran just now. And then I arrow. So I'm just arrowing down, arrow up. I get the previous before that. So you notice this is what was run before. Now I'll do it again. Now it's that, do it again. And so just going back through my history. So if there's something that you made an error on and you just like to run it again, you can also just go down to your console and push an arrow up. And then you can just have that line ready for you to revise. And so what I wanna revise here is I wanna do range instead of variance. So range, and I get the minimum value and the maximum value for that marker, okay? So that's range. And now aggregate, <clears throat> aggregate is giving you that statistic, but it's going to split your groups for you, okay? So here you see aggregate is the function. I would like to compute my statistic on age. So I want the means of ages, okay? So I want age to be computed on here. I want age split by site, okay? So I want, for each site, I want to get the mean age. So the last argument is the function, all right? So if we were to run that aggregate um, DF2 age list, so the second argument has to be a list, even if you're only putting in one site or one factor but I'll use two factors next and we can see what that'll do. So DF2 um, site and let's do mean. And you just want the name of the function. Don't have any parentheses like it made me do automatically, okay? So group one is this first factor split. So site and then it splits it. But wouldn't it be easier if I could actually see um, which site it is. So there we go, now we have the name. So it updates it, right? So instead of one, two, it's site one, site two. But let's say I actually, I, I want it split between site and sex. So the way you would do that is in the list, that's the second part here, DF2 and then sex. And actually I want it to be sex factor. M and F is not enough for me. I want it to be spelled out. So here we go. And it's going to give me site one male, site two male, site one female, site two female. Let's say you wanna um, add confidence intervals. 
So you want to compute the standard deviation and then use that to uh, compute confidence intervals on these. Instead of mean, now you use SD. And so then again, now instead of the means for each of these groups, you're getting the standard deviations for each of them. Okay. I'm curious myself, so I'm going to do range. Let's see. So now range outputs two variables, right? It outputs the minimum and the max. So now for each site and sex, I get the minimum and the maximum age value. And so it's just an easy way to get like a full kind of descriptive stats split by whatever factors you like it split by. But notice it didn't have to be splitting factors. We can do it with these not encoded as factors. So sex, for example, is not encoded as a factor and it will still work. So it's just going to be splitting on unique values, not necessarily factors. All right. If you get a missing value, so if you have a, a missing value um, output by mean SD range, then that means there is a missing value in your data and you'll want to do NA omit before you compute the mean in general. So what NA omit does is it gets rid of the missing value and then it says now compute the mean. All right. So I will just show that quickly. Um, v miss, I'm going to make a vector that's one, seven, two, NA, 993. Okay. All right, Lambert, we're going to get back to you. Like we will, you'll find your way back. Trust me. Um, so there's a vector with missing values. Let's say I wanted to take the mean of this vector. Okay. So I just do mean V miss. And I get a missing value because there is missing values in that VMIS vector. So what I would do instead is mean NA omit VMIS. And now it will compute because NA omit VMIS. It takes these values. So see, here's our vector with all those values, but the missing value is gone. And so what this attribute says is the fourth value is missing. So it's saying this fourth value has been removed. So it tells me what values have been removed at what location. Um, and it returns um, my vector without missing values. So when I compute the mean, it's computing it on a vector with no missing values. Okay. Okay. We're all, we're going to come back to these. Okay. I know that's this aggregate took me a while to get my head around. So if you don't get that one right now, don't worry about it. This can be just kept as your reference. Okay. Um, now the table function um, actually just tells you unique values, but it counts them as well. So remember when I was showing you here, you could have unique values for treated. So treated has ones and zeros. But let's say now we've created our factors. Let's say I want to know how many are in each of those groups. So I can use table DF2 treatment factor. And I have 50 controls and 50 treated. Okay. So table is not just giving me the unique values. Because if I just did unique, unique. DF2 treatment, oops, treatment factor. It gives me treated and control, but table counts how many treated and control. Okay. So this table could have been used up here when you were creating your factor. If you wanted to know the unique values up here, you could have said table DF2 treated. There are 50 zeros and 50 ones. Makes sense. It should be the exact same number um, as the control and treated. All right. Now, the cool thing is, and this is excellent for checking that you've done your um, actual factor encoding correctly, you do table um, DF2 sex, DF2 site, for example. Or better yet, let's do table treatment factor 
DF2 treated. So it's a cross tab table. And now we're counting how many controls are zeros, 50 of them. All of the controls are zeros. And how many ones are called treated? And that's also 50. And so none of the values that you have encoded as control are ones. This is exactly right. Because what you did here was up here where you encoded your factor, you said, if it's a zero, make it control. If it's a one, make it called treated. And this is confirming that that's been done. Okay, so it's a cross tab of your... Okay, so, whoops, I'm, all right. Reza has a raised hand. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, yes, please. So when we are checking on the table, say we didn't do any NA omit, right? When we yeah. uh, change the factor. So say there was an NA mm -hmm. in there in the site yeah. uh, or treatment. Um, so when we are converting, are there going to be change into like when you're which are converting to factor, are they going to be changing into one of these or it will be an A? Very good question. Yeah. It just is kept as missing. That's a great question. So that's a nice thing. Um, when, when R is computing like means and standard deviations and things, it, it needs everything to not be missing because it's creating some summary statistic. But when you're doing a factor conversion, if there's a missing value, it just remains a missing value. So um, it will handle that internally. Very, very good ask, uh, very good question. Um, all right. So here, tables similarly, let's say there's a missing value here. It also, it will just be a new category essentially. Like tables are also fine with missing values. It just counts them as a new category here um, so that you know that there's a missing value there, but it won't be adding it to some group. Um, it looks like Mugda, it may be that has your data. Oh no, it has been read in. Hey, yeah, I'm not sure what what's causing the error. Ah, you have a space after factor um, in one of them. That might be an issue uh, instead of it um, having your parentheses follow. So see, there's a space for one of them. Um, that should help uh, with one of them. Um, Interesting. Okay, I fixed that, but that doesn't fix um, the one for sex and sight. Hmm. You may want to try reading in your data again. It could be that uh, sometimes it will have. Um, I believe that you've just downloaded the wrong uh, data source. So if you see at the top in line four, it says assignment data to, you want example mm. data to. So uh, your code should actually be correct. It's just those columns don't exist in assignment data. Okay. Yeah, okay. No Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Yeah, sometimes you've got it all right and it's just the wrong data. Good, thank you for asking. All right, so um, tables can also be embedded in bar plots. So here, I'm actually gonna run this sex site table here. So let's do it here. Um, sex factor site. All right, so we have 25 males at site one and 25 males at site two and 25 females at site one and 25 females at site two. So great, even division. This is obviously, they were recruited in this way. And now I can actually run a bar plot around them. So here, bar plot is just wrapped around table. 
And that will produce a bar plot where I'm stacking the different groups here um, in my bar plot. So here is what should show up if you run bar plot around your table. So you're just plotting the table essentially. So once you guys have this bar plot of your table here, go ahead and click yes. And if you've had any errors along the way, please also just share them on the, the Slack. I think it will help us all. Lambert, are you a little less lost now or uh, are you still in no man's land? Still lost. Okay, great. Um, Gabby, could you pull Lambert into a, a breakout room? Sure. Thank you. Awesome. We got a lot of yeses climbing up there. That's good. Good to see. And feel free to, now you have a bar plot. Bar plots use the same base R um, plotting uh, options as um, the box plot and the histogram we made before. So give it a try. See if you can change colors, um, change uh, access labels, um, you know, add a legend. Maybe see what's up. Mm. Um, Reza, when you encoded your site, did you have one, two as the levels or did you have zero, one? Because it could be that um, uh, none of them were in site one if it's zero. Um, so if you put in your factor levels as levels that don't actually exist in the data, um, it's just not going to have anyone in that group. Um, so you may need to recode your um, factor, your site factor. Yes. Yes. I'm not glad I'm responding to you. Yes. I will find one and put it in. Yeah, so Emma, check out the table and see what values you're getting for the table. Um, it may be that your site, again, uh, if it's zeros and ones or um, Again, oh, also sex, uh, if it's not encoded uh, correctly, then um, that could be a reason for this. Let's see. Oh, it looks fine on sex and site. Um, try, yeah, for the bar plot, try um, not doing sex factor, just sex and site for yours. It looks like the factors maybe weren't encoded correctly. And ran. Just rerun the plot, ran. 
um, if you just rerun your plot, the, it will overwrite the legend. The legend will be gone. But as you add legends, as you see it, it just pastes it on top. So to um, refresh it, you just need to plot the plot again. Awesome, guys. And I'm going to look for a nice um, base R plot options. Cheat sheet. Okay, found it. Link. And I'm just adding a link to the base R plotting cheat sheet. I'll put it in the Slack, but I'll also put it in our Google Doc. Base our plotting cheat sheet. So here it's in the Google Doc um, here, um, which you can just see here, different points, axis, lines, um, lab, main, sub, Etc. Um, but if you even just Google, um, or actually, I'll, yeah, base, there's many. Okay, so I just took this top one, but there's many. And this is what I mean Google is your best friend uh, when you're working with R. Okay, um, but I'll also put that link in the Slack. Base. Our plotting cheat sheet. All right. Excellent. Okay, it looks like almost everybody's got it. Don't forget to click yes once you've got your plot up. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I know which colors pertain to which sex because they're in the same order as the colors that I would specify. So uh, this is why factors are great because you know the order. Order matters a lot. Um, so if I have males first, female second, then the color, the first color is going to be with males. The second color is going to be with females. Yeah, it's a really good question, Christina. I'm just gonna write order. The order matches the uh, factor levels. But yeah, it's very confusing here, right? Because here, how would you know? And it's the same number too. So there is really no other way to know. Um, it's much easier if you knew like, oh yeah, I have like five versus 50 in one group. All right, so tables are great too because you can use them to conduct chi-square analyses. Um, so uh, just like you can wrap bar plot around your table, you can wrap chi-square chi around your table. So here I have the same table, um, but I'm wrapping the chi-square test around it. Or I actually, no, I have a different table. I now have a treatment factor, but regardless, both are fine. If you wrap chi-square test around it, you can actually run a chi-square test and get a p-value out um, along with your chi-square statistic. Okay, so try this with the other two comparisons, site and sex and treatment and site. And click yes once you've done two more chi-square tests, okay?
next one. We got one. So just uh, a little statistical kind of reminder, the chi-square test, we're testing for um, independence between two groups, uh, two groupings um, in a table, a cross-tab table. That's why we can do this chi-square test on the table. We're testing that the groupings are independent between them. If they're not, if you are seeing um, a non-independent effect between uh, two groups uh, kind of coming together in any way, then you'll have a statistical significance. Um, but the chi-square test is actually computed on the table of your data itself, and that's why this works actually. Um, you don't have to run chi-square tests this way, um, but it's a nice way to do it that's uh, very clean uh, for your understanding. So it's two categorical variables. And don't forget to push yes once you have it. Very nice. Looks like everyone's getting it. Great work. Okay. Does this have to be done with the factors? Like it has to be with the categorical? That is a good question. I don't think so because it's a table. So like we saw before, a table is just going to divide up all of your um, unique values and count them. So I don't, you shouldn't need a, a factor variable for this. Um, okay. Yeah, good question. Um, if it isn't a factor, um, you want to make sure it is an actual grouping variable. Um, and if you put in a um, continuous value, it will just count the unique values. So um, most oftentimes it'll just be one, 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 one in each of those groups because you'll have lots of unique continuous values. Um, so it is important that it's a, a category, but it doesn't matter if it's factor encoded. All right, guys, nice work. I'm going to move along. I'm going to go ahead and clear it. I think we're close to everyone being there. And if not, uh, you should be there very shortly. Now, we just looked at bar plots. So back to bar plots, we can update this bland bar plot from earlier to be more descriptive using techniques from our box plot example, as I alluded to before. Um, I also put a little base R plotting cheat sheet um, linked in the Slack. But as I showed you, if you just Google that as well, there are other versions of those cheat sheets and some might be easier for you to read than others. So um, really choose the resource that works the best for you. Um, but here, yeah, this is very not descriptive. And especially if you show this to someone, I mean, even I who know the data, um, I'm not totally sure what I'm looking at here. For example, is um, are males or females the darker gray or lighter gray, for example. Um, so we want to make these larger uh, we want to change the colors and add a legend. We want to move the bars to beside each other, actually. We don't want them stacked like they are. And um, yeah, so we can have bar plot. We start with the table, and then we put a comma after the table and start filling in more plotting options. So you can push tab after. Um, I'm actually going to skip past this here. Um, so what you can do is, you can add beside equals true. So the reason I wanted you to press the tab there, you can see here I start, I have my table. I have open parentheses here. This, I can tell this closed parenthesis goes here because it highlights it in R, see, that's highlighted. Now I go after my comma and I press tab. It's giving me all these options for my bar plot. Okay, so um, the amount of space I want my width of my bar plot to take up, the width, I can actually uh, choose the width and heights. 
um, legend text beside and this is the one we really want so beside here it says it's a logical value if false the columns of height are portrayed as stacked bars this is the default this is what we're actually seeing on the screen right now if true the columns are portrayed as juxtaposed bars what that actually means is they're just beside each other like beside equals true so that's what we want to do so here we set beside equals true to have those bar plots next to each other. We want the colors for each factor, the first variable in the table above. So uh, call Dodger blue will be the first factor level and dark orchid will be the second factor level. The levels we set, um, this is the legend kind of recapitulating this, but we have set the levels and you can check in your own code. Maybe you haven't, in which case you want to swap this. The levels I set in my code are N is first and F is second. So I would match that exactly. If you're not sure about your levels, let's actually check levels DF2 sex factor. And it will tell you um, the levels that you've put them in, the order that you've put them in. Um, and so with the labels on there. So if we're not sure, we can actually check it using the levels function on our factor variable here okay so males first females second here so blue is for males dark orchid is for females we want our axis labels to be one and a half times larger again and we want our um, axis limits to actually make it easier to fit a plot into so um, like we saw before it it was kind of quite tight um, and we want to actually add some extra space here. So what YLIM 0 to 40 is doing is actually making it so the whole um, tech or sorry, the whole graph axis goes up to 40, even if the, the actual data doesn't fill it in that length. Um, so here we're just making a taller, bigger graph to fit legends into. And we're also going to make our axis text larger. So it's easier to see the numbers themselves down here. We're making the legend text larger. Um, and we're also going to set our legend at the top of where we put the limit. So we're putting it over to the right and at the very top. OK. So go ahead and give that a try. Um, obviously, use whichever colors you like. Play with where you put the legend. You can even play with these Y limbs, maybe these CX values. You want them much larger, even smaller. They can be less than one if you want to make really tiny um, text. Um, and go ahead and click yes once you've gotten your graph, your revised graph up. Awesome. We've got two people already. Very nice work. Another thing you can do um, is instead of writing out your um, levels here, your um, uh, factor levels, you can actually use the levels function um, and have it put the output here. So instead of writing CMF, you could write levels sex factor, this DF2 sex factor. So levels DF2 sex factor, and it will print that vector of the levels that you have um, automatically. So that's another option. Um, that I've just thought of now. X 
Excellent. We've got a few people having a nice bar plot up. Don't forget to click yes once you've got it. You guys are going to be pros at plotting by the end of the day. Ah, it doesn't look right. Do you want to um, put it up for us to see? Yeah, great. Yeah, that's that looks right, Dahlia. So um, what's happening there is the legend's a bit far over. Also, you've rewritten the legend a few times, so it keeps adding it again and again. Um, try um, moving the legend um, on the x-axis. Uh, so try to move it a little over. Um, and then maybe you want to even make your y limb uh, larger. If you make your um, whole plot frame larger, it also might fit a bit better. Um, but yeah, that's that's really what's happening. What's the difference between adding the legend with a longer strip? That's a great question. Um, Christina, let's try just adding legend text. So a vector, so legend text, it wouldn't be equals true, it would be a vector of text used to construct the legend for the plot. Oh, or a logical ind indicating whether a legend should be included. So let's see. Yeah, it works fine. So you can also do that instead of typing your legend out here. The main difference is the text, uh, the CEX here, you won't have that control and you won't have the control of where to put it. Um, that's the only difference, um, but uh, yeah, it should be fine to do. Okay, thanks. I saw it in your script actually, which is why I wondered. Yeah, let's try again here. Let's see what this will do. Yeah, it's pretty good. Okay, thanks. Yeah, of course. One thanks for asking. Yeah, one caveat with that approach is that you can't uh, select the exact position. And then if you wanted to use like different formatting between the legend and the bar plot um, or like any other plot, that would be quite difficult to manage. Mm -hmm. In terms of like size and font and that kind of thing? Yeah. Yep. Nice. So an additional option there. Um, and that's something too that's really nice. If you just press tab again, like uh, here with looking at bar plot and you go to the next option, you can just uh, arrow down through. Dahlia, great question. So I'm going to create the problem and then I'm going to show you how to solve it. So here we've got legend and then I'm like, oh, that's not really, uh, maybe I want this to be um, levels. PF2 sex factor. So then I do it again and then let's say, oh, you know what? I actually want it to be over uh, there, nope, that's not the right place. So I'm going to make another one here. Okay, that's fine. Um, and so now I have a lot of legends. The way to get rid of it is to run your plot again and then run the legend again. And so you'll only have one there. Okay. All right, guys, don't forget to click yes once you've got it. It looks like we're almost all there. Really excellent. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, but also thank you everyone for pl 
plotting or uh, not plotting, uh, posting your errors, sharing them with everyone. It's really helpful for us all to work together on them um, and ask questions. Okay, so this is something like what you should be seeing. Um, and from here, actually, sorry guys, um, we are gonna go on a short break um, just because just to keep to our, our normal break schedule. So um, we'll take about a 10 minute break. Um, so um, we've done this a lot here. I'm just showing the output. If we were to run view DF2 is uh, what I'm calling this data is DF2. Um, and we see that we have five markers, okay? So this is common, right? You'll have like lots of different gene expression values, maybe lots of different microRNA, um, whatever you have, right? So these are biomarkers of some kind. And you wanna see which, if any, are associated with uh, the treatment. So um, if these biomarkers are changing maybe in response to a treatment, all right? So first, let's plot these markers against each other. Um, so we want to see if any of the markers are correlated. That's what I mean when I say plot them against each other. And here, what I'm showing is a pairs plot, okay? So you're going to use the pairs function, um, and you're going to uh, create a scatter plot matrix using this. And so essentially, we want to have a scatter plot of all against all. So all five markers against all five markers. Here, this is the argument to the pairs function. It's a matrix. So we want to just take those five marker columns and subset them. Okay. So remember, data frame subsetting, we take rows before the comma and columns are after the comma. If we leave it blank before the comma, we want all the rows. So here, we're selecting all the rows. And for the columns, we're selecting any column. Uh, so any of the names that have the pattern marker in it, okay? So that's what this is giving you. So if you highlight and run grep pattern equals marker, x equals names df2 to see what columns grep is indexing, you can find the indices that match the pattern, okay? And we want all, all rows, so we left it blank. We want the df2 columns that have marker in the name. Okay, so I'm going to show you this in the code and then I'm going to go back to this. So here, grep pattern equals marker, x equals names df2. So I'm just highlighting this internal bit here. And what this is giving me is these columns. But if I go to df2, or it's here already in my view, these are the column numbers being selected. So one, two, three, four, five, six, six seven, eight, nine, 10. These are the columns that I want. So you could also just say instead here, um, so here we're doing it um, using logic, but we could also have said, I just want columns six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Oops, sorry, 10. And this will also give me those columns. All right, so DF2. Those are the only columns that are selected. All right, so that's what it's doing there. It's just finding the columns for you and then um, selecting them. All right, so once you've been able to do this, go ahead and click yes. You should have a plot that comes out um, for you. Nice. Very nice. All right. If some of you work on the command line, grep, you, you may recognize. Um, it's, a, it's a common uh, regular expression function. There are other ways to actually do this beyond what I even just described. So feel free to explore those ways if you'd like as well, um, if you've been able to um, do this already. Um, also, pairs is another base R plot. So you can also you know, experiment with changing things about the plot itself. It is a little bit different, you'll see. 
um, but uh, you can certainly make changes on it. You could also look at the um, base R um, uh, cheat sheet that I sent and uh, check out, you know, if there's some changes there that you see that you'd like to make on this, because now you've got a scatter plot so you can change things about the points or um, point sizes, colors, different things like that. All right. Coming along, I'm going to make sure everyone's got it. Um, so I'm just going to wait two more minutes. Nice. Global regular expression print. Awesome. Uh, Grep looks for a pattern. And here it's um, outputting the location of that pattern. So the pattern it's looking for is marker and the uh, vector it's looking for the pattern in is the names of your data frame. So it looks across the names and if it finds that pattern, it's like, oh, it's at, you know, element six. Okay, keep that. It's at element seven, keep that. Um, and so it's very, very useful for these things. All righty guys. Okay, so I will continue on here. I'm gonna go ahead and clear. A few people haven't gotten it yet, but I think it's okay. You'll get it on the flip side. This part isn't so essential, um, but I think this is a really nice plot to summarize your data, um, especially if you know maybe uh, you'll find that markers are very correlated with each other. Here, we see that they actually seem quite uncorrelated. So that's good to know. Um, we don't have essentially collinearity. If you have, um, different um, predictors for a linear regression, for example, this plot can show you if those uh, different predictors are actually correlated with each other. And maybe they'll um, have that covariance being thrown out of the linear regression. That's good to know upstream. So these can be very useful plots, these pairs plots um, to do on your data. So now let's plot them against, against our treatment. Um, can I see the grep and columns I number code, please? Yes. Um, so uh, I'm gonna do this quickly and then Reza, I'm gonna put that code up for you, okay? Um, so next we're gonna plot each marker by the treatment factor, okay? So here we're doing box plot. Uh, here we set our data, uh, DF2 here. But first actually, we wanna have multiple plots all in one um, plot plot pane, I should say. So we set the plot window as one row of plots by five columns. And so this means we're going to have five plots all next to each other in a row. All right. So that's done using par MF row equals concatenate. So it wants a vector here and it wants it to be uh, rows versus columns. So one row, five columns of plots. Oops, pardon, there we go. And then you make five box plots and it's going to make five box plots all in a row here. All right, so once you've done that, go ahead and click yes. And then Reza, here you go. I'm just gonna put this code up here, right there. So you want to keep track of your parentheses on this one, parentheses around names, parentheses around for the grep, and then your bracket, and then your parenthesis for the pairs. Nice, we've already got one. It's pretty easy with a copy and paste. Tomorrow we'll explore how to actually do this more, a bit more elegantly and quickly. Um, with a loop.
And so it should output five plots all in one pane. Excellent. Looks like a lot of people are getting this one. We're missing the treated label. Ah, yeah, because it's squished. So if it doesn't fit, it's going to just throw out some of the labels there. Um, one way to fix that is LAS equals two. It will rotate your labels so they're um, up and down um, on that. So here, I believe. LAS equals two. Let me check this. Um, I need to make my figure margins quite large. Yeah. So that LAS equals two, now control treated is going to be there. Whereas here, it just kicks out the other one. Can you just show the command again? Mm -hmm. LAS equals two. Yeah, Alexander, great question. So we specify the data frame here. So data equals DF2. That's why we can just use the column name here. Um, but if you don't specify that, you don't have to specify data equals DF2. You could also do DF dollar sign marker tilde DF dollar sign treatment factor, and that that would work just fine. Awesome. Don't forget to click yes once you got it. Great. It looks like we're almost all there. Really excellent questions. Certainly things that everyone's encountering. Hmm. Let's see. Ah, so Nagla, that issue means that, see, I'm even getting it here. It's it's plot margins too large here. Um, it's because this pane, this plotting pane is too small. So if you just get to uh, this four square arrow there and move it to a larger size, it will uh, resolve that issue for you. All right, everyone. One moment. Okay, I think we're okay to move on. I'm just gonna click over to the next screen here where we can see this one obviously had it blown up to a huge plotting pane. So it was fitting both controlled and treated, um, but we had a great question while everyone was working on why is it being kicked out there? It just is kicked out because of the size. So notice even as I made this window larger, now I see it on both sides, all right? So it just cuts out uh, whatever won't fit. Um, it's a kind of annoying behavior, frankly. Um, but if you wanna rotate them, you can use the command, uh, or not the command, the argument, LAS equals two. So that's what I did on this first one. And now I've got control and treated there. Um, but you see it's cutting into that. I wonder if it's now done. Yeah, it's still doing it. Um, so then we might want to change um, how far this treatment factor goes up. Gorgeous. Can you Wonderful. Put them on an angle as well. What? Can you put them on an angle as well or just kind you of? You almost certainly can. I'm not 100% sure how you do that. So I, I really, I suggest you Google it up. Um, otherwise, I will Google it later and uh, print the uh, the um, solution. Yeah. No worries. I can look it up. I was just curious. Awesome. Yeah. No, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. I just know the LAS equals two because I've had this issue so many times. Um, great. So, okay. So that's how you will get multiple plots in one window using base R. Um, they don't even have to be the same plot. So this, these are five different box plots that we've put, um, but it could be that one is a box plot, one is a histogram, one is a 
um, you know, silhouette plot. One is, a, I don't know about silhouette plot. One is a strip chart, et cetera. You can add different plots. They just um, are just being arranged on that window using that par MF rows equals uh, concatenated one by five. So it's just going to fill in those five spots with five different graphs or plots. All right. So you may only see control um, or neither label if your plot pane's too small. Um, LAS2 is going to rotate those for you. So, but can we do this doing ggplot? And we can. We can make a much nicer, uh, I would argue actually in this case, uh, plot using ggplot. The difference is here, we have total flexibility for each of these plots. So in this specific case, um, I'm going to show how we can make a ggplot um, like this. But um, I would say uh, if you have different plots that you want in each of these individual panes, uh, base R is probably going to work better for you. So let's say you wanted like a, a box plot here and a um, scatter plot here and a bar plot here, et cetera, then you probably want to use R. Um, and I'm just going to illustrate that really quickly. Um, so let's say here, you don't want just all box plots. You want box plot and then you want scatter plot. And the scatter plot is just plot. Um, and I'll say marker one versus marker two. And then let's say I want my next one to be another box plot of marker two. And then I want the next one to be a histogram. All these, these uh, spaces, like the enters and everything, these are um, just for myself. Um, and let's say I want another histogram, but I want this to be marker one and marker two. Okay, so now these five slots are all filled in. I'm gonna fill them in with new plots now. So I'll plot this one again. Now I'll plot this one. Marker one is not found, I uh, see. Let's see if it'll do it this time, nope. So this one, X, doesn't like the data command. So if that happens, whoops, sorry guys. If that happens, just use the dollar sign. So there, now I have a scatter plot. Now I have another box plot. And then this marker one is not found. So again, if it does that, just go ahead and do a dollar sign command. I would have assumed that would have worked. So now I have a histogram of that one there. And do you see how, oops, sorry. It's just filling in these slots. It has five slots and you can put whatever graph you want in those, whatever base R graphs you want in those. Okay, and so this is where it gets really flexible and it's really nice to work with base R in this way if you wanna be um, putting multiple plot panes. I'm just gonna do one more demo where I actually change this layout. And let's say I want one, two, three, four, like a square, two by two. I can make this now two by two, two rows, two columns. And then let's say I want it like just these four. So now I have four plot panes to fill in or four slots. So I run that par MF row here. So now it's going to give me this. So one, two, three, four that I'm filling in, okay? Now there's my second one going in, my third one going in, and my fourth one going in. Again, these can be whatever plots you want. And you are just setting up, I want two rows, two columns of plots, and they're going to be filled in one, two, three, four, right? Like you read a book. Okay. So that's just, uh, just to show you the kind of um, flexibility of this kind of approach. But now going back to this one, because we're plotting the same kind of data, the same type of plot, um, and we're just splitting it across different markers, we can actually do this really elegantly in ggplot, okay? So let's do it. So first we need to reshape our data. So this is where it's really important to, to think about how our data is actually set up. 
our data currently is set up in a wide format. So we have different scores of different variables placed in different columns. We've got marker one, marker two, marker three. What we want to transform it to is one index variable that says marker one, marker two, marker three, and then another variable that's value. So this is just the marker's value, all right? So a long column. So this is if we had three markers, you can think of it extended to five, right? And we're essentially stacking these on top of each other. So we're gonna make a long column and it's just the values the marker takes on. And then another column that tells you, am I looking at marker one, two, three, four, five, okay? So long format scores on different variables, they're all in a single column. And we have some index or some reference here telling us what we're looking at in a separate column. So this is done using the melt function, okay? So this comes from the library reshape. We installed this package, I believe at the beginning, um, or you would have even before we started. Um, so you're gonna go ahead and library in reshape. You should see a check mark. Um, in that library tab. And then you're going to create a new long data frame, okay? DF2 melt uh, is what I'm calling it here. And you want your data argument here to be the wide data frame, so DF2. Our ID variables, so these are the ones we want to keep per person. These are the ID, the site factor, the treatment factor, and age. So each of these, they're going to be repeated actually for each one of those markers that are stacked on top of each other because for each individual, they keep the same site factor for all of them. They keep the same age and so forth, okay? Then the measure variable, this is the one that's going to be made into one long column. So this marker one, marker two, marker three, marker four, marker five, all right? Um, these are the columns that we're just going to stack. All right, and the variable name we want for the column that's gonna be the reference column, and it's just gonna have these variable names in it, we're gonna name that marker, all right? So that's what our reference is gonna be. So once you run this and you see in your environment that you have DF2 melt created, go ahead and put a yes, all right? Nice, I see some have it already. Good work. If you if you use um, names, um, I'm just gonna cover this really quickly. Names, DF2, it will actually print out these column names so you can copy and paste them too if it's easier and faster um, to not be um, making spelling errors. So that's just the names command that we covered earlier.
Great job, Ren. I think that's right. So what's the... That's it. It's in your environment. You created it. Oh, I just created some. Oh, okay. You just that's created it. Yeah, I think nice. you did it right. Yeah, good My job. My concept <laughs> of what the outcome should be. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's anticlimactic. Yeah. A lot of work for just uh, a little. <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> no worries. All right, and go ahead and click yes once you've got it. So again, it should just show up in your environment uh, pane. And that's it. It'll run ideally error-free, and that's it. So is this like a semi unpivot because you're not kind of doing mm -hmm. it for everything, but just yeah. specifically for marker. That's markers. exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So you want to select things that you're going to pivot and then or unpivot, so to speak, and then mm -hmm. everything else you want to keep in that same format. Yeah. Um, Dahlia, could you print the warnings? Um, so see how it says use warnings uh, and then close. If you just run that exact command, it'll tell you the warnings because uh, if there are warnings, it's actually okay. Um, it, it may be just fine. What you're showing looks like it, it may be just fine, yeah. And it looks like you also have, um, Ah, one thing is you missed marker one, so it, you you just have like uh, fewer um, rows than I would expect. Um, but otherwise, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so those warnings. Sometimes something catches in a graphic state. I'm just going to show everyone this really quickly. Um, sometimes you get lots of warnings. I can't reproduce them so easily. Um, but if you are getting warnings like Dahlia, or, or sorry, like Diego is showing here, this like um, display, do try catch, et cetera, et cetera, um, that can be gotten rid of by simply running dev off. What that's going to do, though, it's going to erase all of your plot history. It's just going to restart your plotting graphics um, because it's like something happened at some point that it was like not happy with. And now it's just going to keep throwing those warnings. Those warnings are fine. If you're fine with getting them too, it's it's okay. It's not hurting anything, but you can write dev.off um, and then just enter and see it just erases it all. Um, that will also um, deal with this do try catch um, um, warnings that you're seeing here. The invalid graphic state is the key like um, is what tells me that that's the issue there. Aha, mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah, so um, Dahlia in what you're showing, so basically you, you don't wanna just run the parentheses. If you wanna see the warnings, you wanna write warnings, warnings. So exactly as it shows, use warnings and then the parent close parentheses um, and see it'll show these warnings. So I'm getting these do try catch issued graphic state. Um, so I just dev off to deal it. Um, okay. Ah, if it can't find function melt, that means you need to library reshape. Um, and if it says there's no package called library or called reshape, then you need to install packages reshape. That's right. Yes, Nagla. You're just going to get, you're just going to have uh, your melted data frame, which I'll go ahead and create here. Melt. Oops. Is that it? Um, and so you have DF2 melt. It should have 500 observations because you will have stacked 
500 length vectors on top of each other, um, but you're basically making cuts of your data frames. So they're just stacking 100 length uh, data frames, 100 row data frames on top of each other. And there's five of them because we have five markers. Um, so we know it should be 500 observations of six variables. Note that the variables, the number of variables went down um, because we made five of those variables into one, and then we added a variable as a reference. So we could go ahead and view that if you wanted to, and you can see you'll have um, a variable column, and then you'll have a value column here. Variable name marker. Huh, it didn't take my variable name. Okay. All right, very nice. All right. I'll go ahead here. I just want to make sure I'm wonderful. Okay. So it looks like we're almost there. I'm going to keep going. Um, and uh, if you're having issues with it, we can get you on the next break because it's going to be um, very easy to get these next few steps, I think. All right, so now you can make your box. You can make your box plot. So you're going to use ggplot again, but here we're using the melted data frame. You're going to use your treatment factor. Um, value is going to be your zero one. Um, facet grid. So I'm saying marker here, but what I see here is it didn't take marker as my um, pardon as my um, variable name. So when I ran that, I'm just going to do it again, DF2 melt. Um, so if you check it out here, if it doesn't say marker here, it just says variable, then uh, the code I'm showing is not going to work. Here, facet grid, tilde, you want this to be the column that is delineating which marker is shown. So here, it should be variable um, if I was going to do this again, um, not marker, OK? Um, but. Uh, we basically just make a geom box plot. Um, we're going to fill it by our treatment factor. So one color for one treatment factor, one color for another one. And then facet grid tilde. Here I say marker, um, but actually it should be variable. And then uh, go ahead and plot this. Um, and you'll see what it will give you. Very similar to what we actually produced before in terms of our bar plots or our box plots, pardon me. X axis labels. Yes. Um, do you want them rotated in ggplot or do you want them rotated in um, base R, Henna? Because you absolutely, anything can be rotated or moved. Yes. Yeah. So that one's going to be um, a more complex um, finding. I suggest just Google it. I literally just Google copy and paste that every time I use it. Um, because it will have you rotate it a certain angle, which you can choose, and then you adjust uh, where it's located, like height-wise as well. It may be in the code coming up, but I don't think so. Um, so just Google exactly rotate x-axis label ggplot. And if you find it, please add it to the Slack. I think everyone will love that. Also, if you have trouble finding it, let me know. But this should give you a
box plots, very similar to the box plots we had before with the five paned box plot in base R. Okay. Wonderful. Looks like four of you got it. Very nice. Feel free to change the colors, you know, maybe scale fill manual on these. Um, no more salmon and turquoise. All kinds of things you could change. And don't forget to click yes once you've got that plot up. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page before we move on. Um, Nagla, check if your column name is marker. It might be variable. It is marker. Okay, it is marker. And then, and treatment factor is capitalized too? Uh, yeah. Okay, try dev off first and then try to plot it again. So remember that dev off um, here, I'll type it in. Um, I just lost you, there we go. Dev off, dev off. Try running that and then plotting it again. Okay. And also see if maybe making your plot pane larger uh, might help. But usually it will be a specific error if that's the case. I don't, I don't think it is necessarily. Um, yeah, Mugna, no worries at all. It looks like DF new didn't get defined. Try DF two. Gorgeous Dahlia. That's right. And once you guys have it, don't forget to click yes. Aha, uh -huh. so Ran, you 
made a beautiful plot. And then what it looks like is you're running scale fill manual without um, the rest of your ggplot call. So instead of adding it on, so a plus sign and then adding on the scale fill manual, you just run it on its own and then it's just outputting kind of uh, a lot of stuff. Um, so you'll want to just plus sign and then um, add it on that way. Excellent. Looks like we're getting there. I'm going to wait for a few more people to get this. Excellent. Great. Glad to hear it, Ran. I'm going to wait for a few more people to get this main plot, um, and then we'll go from there. Um, how would this be different if there were more than two treatment groups? Yeah, it would be more um, uh, additional box plots. Um, so instead of two colors here um, and two box plots next to each other, it would be, say, three box plots or four box plots. Um, and then still split by different markers. And again, if you guys are one of the 11 who have already got it sorted and working and looking great, um, try to customize your plot. Try to change things about it to make it look better because the default is not particularly nice. Mm. So Ran, LAS2 is base R. So to rotate here, you'll have to use a GG plot. So go ahead and try to find it online. See how you would rotate the axes. Just Google rotate ggplot axes and you'll find the exact piece of code. You can literally copy and paste it right in. Um, I'll show you all after this. The You'll even see my Google search. That is uh, how I sort it. Wonderful, Diego. I'm glad that worked. Yeah, dev off, man. It just solves all the graphics problems basically. Yeah, so Mugda, it it's, looks like you don't have a column that's treatment with a capital T. Um, so go ahead and do a view on your on your data frame. So if you um, go to this, your DF2, and you click this guy, you can see your data frame columns, and maybe you have a treatment factor, or you can use treated. Um, but there, you you want to make sure it's a column that exists um, in your data frame because that's what those errors are saying. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and run this one and see if I keep it with marker like I showed before, it's, um, it's not happy with me because my computer or my run made it actually into just variable. So here, oops, no, I'm going to do this again. Marker, df2 melt, I'm going to check it, still called variable, so fine. Um, so here, variable, and this is what you guys should be seeing. All right, so similar to what we did before, um, where it was um, filling in with multiple different um, box plots, here, ggplot has a really nice uh, functionality called facet grid, and it allows you to automatically split your graph between different factors. So here we have markers, um, our different groups, and we're splitting them. Um, ggplot is automatically making this a factor variable, and it's ordering it in the order that it's ordered in your data frame. If you don't like the order here, you need to make a new factor and you order the factor differently. 
Okay, so I'm going to repeat that. Let's say we actually don't want it ordered marker one, two, three, four, five, etc. What I would do here is now I have DF2 melt, DF2 melt, and I'm going to make it um, marker factor, factor, um, and DF2 melt. This is going to be a factor of my variable um, column name or my variable column. So here, the reason I'm using variable here is because I want to make a factor variable out of this, okay? And I want it to be ordered differently than one, two, three, four, five, right? So here, I'm going to say factor is this, and then I want levels because my levels are the same as my labels. I can actually leave, I don't have to specify labels here. So I'm going to make this marker three is, let's say what I want first, marker one, marker two, marker four, and marker five. Okay. So now I've got a new factor. And so now when I make my box plot again, I'm going to change this to marker factor, marker factor, and it should be reordering them. So now marker three is first. Often you'll find that the default is not the order that you actually want. And the way to fix it is factor. Use the factor function, make your own factor and order those factors in the order you wanna see. Three, one, two, three, four, five. This is the exact order that I specified here. Three, one, two, three, four, five. And then I changed it to marker factor, okay? All righty. Nice. So as before, I'm just going to check the Slack. Mm. Nice. There we go, Ran. So Ran has added code for um, changing the axis um, rotation. So that's how you would uh, rotate the axis text. Okay. We want to update the color legend and title. We want to update the axis labels. Um, and we have the same theme from before. So remember we set theme um, to classic. That's why it's a white background. If we hadn't done this, this would have had a gray background because that is the default in R. Um, so you can update the theme if you'd like. Um, so go ahead and update these axis labels, the colors and the legend title, um, the axis text. And even if you want to update how it's rotated, maybe change the rotation um, of these to be up and down, um, like at a 90 degree angle instead of flat like they are or horizontally placed. Um, go ahead and do that. And then um, I'm going to clear all and just go ahead and click yes once you've done that. Okay. And for those of you who are trying to get this graph still, um, just feel free to just set up your, um, uh, paste in your uh, screenshots of your errors, anything you're seeing that's not working correctly, um, and we can keep helping you. That's right, Nagla. Beautiful. And don't forget to click yes once you've got these all updated. All right, what do we see here? So yeah, here we go. Just make sure that you library in reshape. Let's run library reshape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I'll paste those lines in for you, Carol. We're, I'm going to post the master script later, um, Carol, but I'll put um, a few of the next lines in here. So there's the box plots and then the GG plot. So this one. 